Amen. Thank you so much for that. Take your Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. While you're turning there, uh, the title of the message is Getting and Keeping a Godly Legacy. Matthew chapter 12. There's a cute comet strip that pictures a Martian on Mars. He's sitting in his home. He's reading the newspaper. And the headlines read, Earth is dying off. Rapid decline in population. As a dad Martian is reading the paper out loud, his son asked him, Dad, why is Earth's population dying off? The dad Martian said, You see, son, the Earthlings have lost all sense of common sense. They're trying to breed within the same sex, and they're killing off their babies before they're born. Whoa! <laughs> Isn't there truth in that? Wow. Now, that makes sense. The sad part about it is that the United States of America is leading in that race. It's leading us in that direction. And if you think about it, there has been a moral collapse in, in America. And with the blessings of God that we have received in the past 200 years, my friends, the Bible says, to whom much is given, much is accountable. I'm going to share some things in, the pa in this passage in Matthew chapter 12 that show how we are accountable to God. And when we allow, when we turn our backs on God, the passage reveals that the end of that person or that country is worse than the beginning. And so we're going to share that. But let me share a few statistics with you. Now, honestly, I have over 100, but I'm not going to read that, all right? I'll barely read 10, all right? Back in 1960, I was born in 63, so that was a long time ago. But back in 1960, 72% of all adults were married. Today, that's less than 50%. The United States has had the highest divorce rate in the world. One out of every three children in the United States live in a home without a dad. Over 59% of all Americans believe that the definition for traditional marriage ought to be changed. That's sad. Gay marriage has already been legalized. Bruce Jenner got tired of being a, a woman and now wants to be a guy again. The average high school boy will spend at least two hours every week on adult websites. The United States has had the highest teen pregnancy rate in the world. At least 30% of all internet traffic goes to pornographic websites. 89% of pornography in the world is produced here in the United States. The average young person will spend, notice this, 10,000 hours playing video games before he reaches or she reaches the age of 21. Since 1973, there have been approximately 60 million abortions in America. Folks, this does not count all the other changes that have taken place, like in 1970s when prayer was taken out of the public schools, the Bible was removed. You can go back in time, you can see when we took those things out of the public schools, there was a rapid decline in the morals, integrity, discipline, and character of America today. If you look at society today, you look at our young people, you look at even young married adults, they lack things that the older generation have. They lack the morals. They lack the character and the integrity. They lack those things because of how they've been brought up. My friends, we do not stand before God innocent. We've allowed those things to happen. We've been conformed into the mold of the world. The Bible says be transformed, not to be conformed. When you come to Jesus Christ, he transforms you into a new creation. He makes you a better person than what you are. When I, I want you to look at the passage here in Matthew chapter 12. Look down at verse 38. It says, Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they repented uh, they repented uh, at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. The queen of uh, the south shall rise up in judgment with this generation, shall condemn it, for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. 
When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Notice the word empty as well. Then goeth he and taketh with him seven, uh, seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Now we understand he's speaking to Israel. Israel had had some blessed promises. They had some, a great past where God showed a miracle after miracle. How he brought them out of Egypt and made them a great and powerful nation. Their first three kings did marvelous things, especially David and Solomon did wonderful things. But my friends, when uh, people have got so much from God and they turn their back on God, they are in danger of destruction. Before we move on, let's pause for just a moment in prayer and ask God to bless the message. Father, in Jesus Christ's name, I come to you and I ask for the filling of your Holy Spirit. I ask that your Holy Spirit will speak to each heart. People came here for different reasons this morning to get something from you. And I ask you in Jesus Christ's name that you'll meet every single need that people have today. There may be some today that need Jesus Christ as their Savior. If they were to die today, they don't know if they'd go to heaven. I pray that today will show them from, from your word how they can know they can go to heaven. Some need sins forgiven. I pray that you show them that. Help us, Lord, to be a people. A people determined to follow you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. In this passage, if you were to go back to some preceding verses, you see where Jesus had just finished casting out devils out of a man. The demon that possessed the man kept that man from able to speak. In other words, it was a dumb spirit, a spirit that kept him from speaking. All right, that's, that's what it means, dumb. He cannot speak. Jesus cast the demon out so that the dumb could speak. People were amazed at what they had seen, and others were searching for answers. How could this be done? By what power has he done this? He casteth out devils by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. In other words, Satan. He's using the name of Satan to cast out devils. And Jesus says, a house divided against itself shall not stand. So he rebuked him over that. But here's the thing. These people were so opposed to Jesus that they could not acknowledge that this was an act of God. This miracle was an act of God. Hey, child of God, if you're going to do right, you need to understand some things. There are going to be some people against you just because you're a Christian. Just because you don't talk like the world or act like the world. They're going to try to get you to go back to those worldly things. And the Bible here has given you a message. Don't do it. You're special. You belong to God. The hypocrisy of the scribes and the Pharisees was that even after witnessing Jesus cast out these demons, after witnessing Jesus heal a man who cannot speak and now he can speak, no matter what Jesus did, it wasn't good enough. They doubted it. They tried to find fault with Christ. Jesus reminded them of two things. We'll get into that just a little bit. He reminded them of Jonah, how he spent three days and nights in the well's belly. And he says, you want a sign? I'll give you a sign. And the sign he was talking about was Jesus going to the cross. He would spend three days and nights in the tomb. And then he would rise again out of the tomb. That's the illustration. That's the sign. Even then, later on, as you read through the book of Matthew and Luke, you see they still uh, lied about it and would refuse to believe. As he spoke to them, he gave them uh, illustrations of two testimonies of two groups of people that would testify against them in the latter days. Both groups of people had already gone on and died. But you see, that tells us something. Life is not over when this life is over. There's life after life. In other words... Uh, the Bible teaches us that uh, for a person to be born again, they'll go to heaven when they die. To be absent from the body is present with the Lord. For those who are lost when they die, they'll not see God. They'll not go to heaven. They'll be cast in the lake of fire. And that's not what God wants for you. That's why Jesus died for your sins. So he gave them the testimony of a wicked generation that did repent from their wickedness through the preaching of Jonah. And he gave them another testimony of the queen of the south, or the queen of Sheba, who uh, she came from afar to witness uh, the miracles and the things they heard about King Solomon. How can a person be so wise? Let's look at a couple of these illustrations. Look back in Nineveh in chapter 12, verse 41. Verse 41, as Jesus is speaking, he says, 
the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and, notice this, shall condemn it. Well, they're already dead. In other words, even later, these people repented from their sin and turned to God and they're going to testify against them. Their witness, their change will be a rebuke against Israel. And then he says, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. And that's Jesus. Jesus says, a greater than Jonah is here preaching to you right now. And that was Jesus himself. The queen of the south, verse 22, I'm sorry, 42. He says, the queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with this generation, shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Solomon, the wisest man in the world. Jesus says, I am wiser than he. I am more powerful than he. Even though he grew up in a home that had nothing, though he's more wealthy than Solomon. So before them, a greater person than Solomon stood before him. Not only was Solomon the king of Israel, but Jesus is the king of kings. He's the king of our salvation. In both these situations, we see a wicked nation who is healed from destruction, whether it be Nineveh or whether it be Israel back then. They were healed from destruction and they repented at the preaching. Nineveh, let's talk about that for a little bit. Nineveh was a very powerful nation. It was great. It was powerful. It was the center of the Assyrian Empire. It was located just off of the Tigris River and the fertile plains there. In other words, they, they were very productive with vegetation, and so they never lacked food. The city itself was so large that as you read in the book of Jonah and you look at history, it took three days for a man to walk all the way through it. It was approximately 60 miles long, give or take a mile or two. So it was wide. It took three days. If you just set out walking through it, it would take you three days to, to go through it. And um, Nineveh's military was very, very powerful. But not only was it powerful, it was so brutal. They ruled the empire with absolute terror. Let me just give you some uh, statistics, and I want to move on because they're pretty gross. They destroyed, they demolished, and burned the cities of their enemies. They took their prisoners and impaled them on stakes. Anyone who rebelled, they flayed them alive and took their skins and covered the walls of the city with them. So people lived in terror. They decapitated their enemies uh, and built pyramids with their skulls. They took people and bricked them in the walls alive. They cut off people's hands, noses, ears, and fingers, and they put out their eyes. Whatever could be imagined, they did this to their enemies. When God told Jonah, I want you to go and preach to that wicked nation, Nineveh, Jonah didn't want to do it. Many Israelites were, had suffered through these brutalities of the nation of Nineveh. He fled from God because he did not want them to repent. He wanted their utter destruction. Can't blame him when you realize how bad that Nineveh was. But God told him, you go preach to them. And I, uh, so that I can give them a chance. Well, when, then, when Jonah did go and preach to them, to his surprise, they repented in sackcloth and ashes. They turned from their wickedness. And because of that, God did not rain down on them judgment. God spared them. And not only did God spare them, he forgave them. You see, that's what God does. Before destruction, he always gives a warning. He gives a warning to repent and turn back to God. And this nation did. And what they received was total forgiveness. And he still does that today. Nineveh was spared. God's mercy was upon them. And Jesus gave this illustration uh, of this in connection with the man possessed with the devil. The devil was cast out of the man. His life was cleaned up. His house be being his life was swept and garnished and empty and meaning that he got cleaned up. Jesus pointed out that the devil will try to return back to his house that he came from. And when he finds it, he's going to find it empty. He's going to find, find it cleaned up. The reason it's empty, because the man uh, who cleaned up his life did not replace the bad with the good. See, Jesus needed to be inhabit that man's heart. That's why he was able to return. What the devil sees is that this man is a playhouse for him. He goes back and he gets seven other demons more worse than himself. Hey, he says, guys, come on, let's have, go to my playhouse and we're going to have fun. 
And God says, the last state of that man will be worse than the first because he turned. When you get things right with God and you clean up your life, my friend, you ought to expect the old habits to want to return. That's what the devil wants to do. He's made stake in your life. He's made claim in your life. And somewhere in your life, you've opened up a heart door for him to come in and to inhabit that part of your life. Whether it's drinking, cursing, carousing around, or whatever it may be, you've opened up access for the devil to come in, and he's abided there for a while. You go to church, you get things swept off, and that means through doing that, the devil's kicked out of your heart and what he wants to do. He wants to come back in. But you've got to do some things. Number one, you need to be saved. The Bible says when a person receives Christ as their Savior, that they're sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. He seals them and says, Devil, this person belongs to me now. You cannot inhabit his heart. But Satan has instilled some things into your mind as well. He's going to do what he can, but now he can no longer take possession of you. But maybe you're here today, and as a saved person, he can't get back into your life as far as possessing you, but he can try to oppress you through deceit, trickery, and lies. Well, come on with me. Let me show you what we've done before. Wasn't that fun? No, it wasn't. That's why you need to replace the old with the good. What happened to Nineveh? Nineveh went back to its former ways. They became worse in their wickedness, and in 612 B.C., the Babylonian Empire came in and completely demolished them, wiping them off of the face of the earth to the point where, <clears throat> excuse me, even archaeologists didn't believe that Nineveh ever existed until the 1800s when they discovered it. They discovered that the Bible is true. This place really did exist. How much more true is it when a Christian repents of his wickedness, he cleans up his life, and he goes back into the world? My friends, God, there comes a time when God says, Hey, listen, my grace is sufficient for thee. When I do a work in you, I do a good work. You don't need to go back as a dog returns to his vomit. You don't need to go back to the world. Follow me. Jesus gave another illustration. The queen of the south. The queen of the south heard the stories of King Solomon. She was so impressed. Go to 1 Kings. Keep your finger here. Go to 1 Kings chapter 10. She was so impressed with the things that she had heard. And she's, she, she didn't even believe him at first. <coughs> she didn't even believe him. And she wanted to see for herself. Notice 1 Kings Chapter 10, I'll start at verse 1. If you haven't found it, I'll, I'll say a verse number here and there so you can catch on. 1 Kings 10, 1. And when the king of Sheba, that's the queen of the south, when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, notice that. He was known to be a man of God. And Christian, you ought to be known in this world as being a child of God, all right? Uh, the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions. Verse 2 says, and she came to Jerusalem, and with a very great train, with camels that bear spices, very much gold, precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him, and all that was in his, her heart. And Solomon told her all qu her questions. There was not anything hid from the king, which he told her not. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all of Solomon's wisdom, and the house that he had built the meat of his table and the sitting of the servants and the attendance of his ministers and there the apparel and the cupbearers and the, the ascent by which he went up into the house of the Lord. There was no more spirit in her. And she said to the king, it was a true report that I heard in mine own land of thy acts and of thy wisdom. How be it, I believed not the words until I came and mine eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. Thy wisdom and the prosperity exceedeth the fame which I heard. Happy are thy men. Happy are these thy servants which stand continually before thee. That hear thy wisdom. Blessed be the Lord thy God which delighteth in thee. To set thee on the throne of Israel because the Lord loved Israel forever. Therefore made he thee king to do judgments and justice. Something was taking place place in his kingdom that proves the Old Testament to be true. You see, David, Solomon's father, was a man after God's own heart. He wasn't a perfect man. You read the mistakes that he made, but the thing was he confessed them. He made them right before God. And God forgave him. 
And still, even at the end of his life, he's still known today as a man after God's own heart. Amen for that. He gives birth, his wife gives birth to their son Solomon. Solomon is going to be the next king. Solomon is also a man after God's own heart. He wants to please God. God put him to a test. Solomon, ask me what you have for me to give to you. Ask me what I will give to you, and I'll give it. Solomon thinks, Lord, your people are great. They're powerful. I'm just a youth. Lord, would you give me this? Will you give me the wisdom to be the king over them? Give me the wisdom to walk in and out amongst your great people, to lead them right in ways that please you. God was so moved with his request. He says, Solomon, not only will I give you wisdom, but you will be the wisest man in the world. Not only will I give you the things that you've asked for, but I'm also going to give you the things you did not ask for. You didn't ask for a long life. As long as you follow me, I'll give you a long life. You did not ask for power and money, but I'm going to give you wealth beyond imaginable. You did not ask for power over your enemies, but I'm going to give you peace in your life as long as you follow me. Solomon's fame was spread throughout the world, and God had blessed him. Back in Deuteronomy, the things that Solomon was experiencing was already foretold and spoken in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 5 through 6, where it talks about the nation that follows God. Let me read it to you. God says, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgment, even that the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do so in the land, whether you go to possess it. Keep them, therefore, and do them. For this is your wisdom. This is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations which shall hear of all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who hath the God so nigh unto them as the Lord your God is in all things uh, that we call upon him for? Do you remember what uh, the Queen of Sheba, she came to him concerning his fame and concerning the name of the Lord? See, Solomon was experiencing this truth. The United States have experienced that truth for a few, for a, for a few years, at least a hundred or so. They experienced where the world would see that is a Christian nation. That is the most powerful nation in the world. My friends, let's take this to another level. Let's take it to a personal level. For a man or a woman to follow God, God wants to bless you and the world around you. He wants you, his child. He wants the world to see you and notice the changes he can do in your life. He can take you out of the miry clay of the world and he can put you on a solid foundation. <clears throat> it doesn't matter the message you've made of your life over here. He says, I'm going to make you a trophy of my grace as long as you follow me. See, there it is, as long as you follow him. And then the world steps back and looks at your life. How come he doesn't talk like us? How come he doesn't respond? He doesn't curse when we try to deceive him. He doesn't strike back. I don't understand this person. You must be a Christian. I am a Christian. Would you come to church with me? Nah, nah, I don't want to go to your church. Only weak people go to your church or go to church. And then they see you're not such a weak person because you can take the criticism. You can put up with the test and no matter what they do to you, God still seems to promote you because that's what God does to his faithful children. See, you can take it to a personal level too. And God did this to the nation of Israel. Now the Queen of Sheba, she's heard the amazing things that are happening to Israel through King Solomon. And the word is out. It's something <clears throat> that is not going away. It's not dying down. At first, she doesn't believe it. It's too good to be true. There's no one in this world that can be as wise as the people are saying that Solomon is. <clears throat> There's no one in this world that can be so prosperous as he is. And even, she admits later, it wasn't even, the half was not even told of how wise he was. As the word continues to spread, she decides, I'm going to take a trip for myself. I'm going to go see this for myself. And she had already arranged the most difficult questions that she could come up with. And I'm sure, being the queen, these are questions that she had concerning her own kingdom and how she could be a better minister to her people. I'm sure she had some tough things. So she gets a, a procession to follow her. 
She brings with her all kinds of precious spices and gold and silver and precious gems. And she goes down to hear Solomon. And she bombards him with these tough questions. Question after question after question. And every time she asks him a question, she's awestruck by the wisdom that flows from her, his mouth. And she's taken back. She observes some things about the king. She watches uh, how he walks in and out amongst his people. She observes his servants. They're happy. She observes his table. It's filled with meat and all kinds of good food. And his servants get to partake of the same food that the kings eat. The cupbearer, his servants. She observes his, the order of things and how they sat and how they walked in, how they served the king, how they loved him, how they respected him, how they lifted him up. She saw how they dressed and everything about the way they even dressed brought honor and glory and majesty to the king. She said it took her spirit away from her. This is a mighty king. This is the wisest man I've ever seen. The people all around him, the way they dress, the way they carry themselves, this is a king. He is wise. And his servants, the cupbearer, they all love him. And Jesus stands before the scribes and the Pharisees. And a greater than Solomon is here. My friends, we ought to be the servants of Christ that are happy to follow him. The queen of Sheba, she observes all these things, even how he ascended up to the house of the Lord. It all glorified God. Solomon's life glorified God. My friend, King Solomon had made such an impact on her that he affected even her kingdom. He helped her kingdom through the wisdom that was given to him from God. This is the blessing that God has promised to all those who follow his son, Jesus Christ. Now back to Matthew chapter 12, if you go back there, as Jesus continues to speak, notice what he says in Matthew chapter 12, verse 43. Remember, all of this goes hand in hand. He's speaking to us today. He says, and when the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when uh, he is come, he findeth it empty, swept and garnished. Then he goeth, then goeth he and taketh with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto the wicked, this wicked generation. What's Jesus saying? He's saying, when God does a work in your life, my friends, he cleans you up and he builds you up. When the devil sees the work that Christ has done in your life, he wants back in. He wants it to cease immediately. And if the devil gets back in, my friends, uh, he's coming back with reinforcements. But those who have allowed God to do a great life in their work in his, their lives, if they turn back and go back to the world, they're going to go back worse than they originally were. Let me give you just a couple of points real quick. One, pleasing God is what we ought to get, shoot for. Pleasing God brings blessing. King David pleased God, and his son Solomon was blessed after him. The Bible says, if you follow God, he says, your children will be blessed after you. You know, I want my life to be blessed. I really do. I want God to bless me. I want him to make me a light in this world. I want him to use me. And... But more so than that, I want my children to be blessed after me. That means I have to make some sacrifices. And that's part of the older generation thinking. Sacrificing myself for my children so they can be blessed of God. That's character. That's morals. That's what a lot of people lack today. But it all comes from the word of God. King Solomon pleased God and all the nations heard of his great fame. And his, he was known for being a child of God. Nineveh pleased God by repenting of their sin. When we repent of our sin, that pleases God. And that also spares us from destruction as well. The second one, turning from God brings destruction. 
Solomon turned his back on God. Go back to 1 Kings chapter 11. You were in chapter 10. Go back to chapter 11. And I'll be quick with this. In 1 Kings chapter 11, we see that Solomon disobeyed God and multiplying horses and wives and all that other thing to himself. He had many wives, and the Bible said they turned his heart away from God. 1 Kings chapter 4, I'm sorry, chapter 11, verse 4. 1 Kings 11, 4. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidians, whatever, and after Milcom and the abominations of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully, notice that word fully, after the Lord, as did David his father. He turned away from those things that he did in the beginning, that how God blessed him and set him up. And now here he is, the end of Solomon was not blessed, it was cursed. Solomon turned from following God and he followed after the gods of the wise. What was his punishment? I'll not read it, but you'll see it in verses 11 through 14. I'll read them real quick. God removed his hand of blessing from Solomon. Solomon's children would pay a heavy price for his sins and peace was removed from his life and from the kingdom. And the kingdom later on, as you see, was split underneath one of his son's reign. Now we look in Nineveh. What happened to Nineveh? Nineveh, here they are. They repented a wicked nation that was brutal and terroristic in their actions. And they repented and God spared them. That was somewhere around the 760 B.C. Later on in 612 B.C., they're already gone back to that wicked lifestyle. They're brutal just like they were before. And what happened? God sent the Babylonians in and completely demolished them. So much so that people in the world didn't even believe they existed. Well, the Bible talks about this, but I haven't seen it. But in the 1800s, they discovered, well, yes, it did exist. And the Bible is right. Israel, later on, he's talking to his generation. Jesus is talking to his generation. A greater than Solomon is here. A greater than Jonas is here. You need to listen to me. And because they turned their back on Jesus Christ, they put their Messiah on the cross. Israel, for the past 2,000 years, have been scattered abroad. We know of their persecutions. We know of the Holocaust that they've been through. They've been tortured. They've been scattered. They've been persecuted for 2,000 years. See, that's what Jesus was talking about. How do you and I turn our backs on God? When we go back to the cursing, the swearing, the drinking, and all the ways of the world that we did beforehand, we leave the godly life behind completely and follow the worldly life. When we ignore the word of God and follow the immorality of the world and accept it as the status quo, we've turned our backs on God. Let me ask you a question. When a person comes to Christ, when a person comes to Jesus Christ, what does Jesus Christ do in that person's life? Let me give you a couple verses. I want to, you to hear what the Bible says. In Ephesians 2.10, the Bible says, For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. In other words, when Jesus Christ, you give Him your life, He does a good work in your life. Not a bad work, but a good work. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. In other words, Jesus says, The work I do in you is a good work. And that's what he does. You don't go wrong following Jesus Christ. You don't go wrong going to his services and listening to his word preached. You don't go wrong when you make your decisions based upon the word of God because it's a good work. It's something he wants to accomplish in your life. The work he does in our lives is good. And my friends, he doesn't leave us where he finds us. He takes us up. He doesn't take us down. He takes us up. He doesn't take us away from, to take away from us. He always adds to us. He grows us. He builds us up. He strengthens us. He makes us something of value. Why? 
Because when you come to him, you've entrusted something very precious to him. And that's your life. That's your soul. And you can be assured that he's going to take care of it. How can I please God with my life? Well, number one, you have to be determined. You have to ha make a determination in your life that you will follow God. If you're not saved, then you need to be saved. You say, preacher, I don't understand that saved. Has there been a time in your life when you told the Lord, I'm not saved. I've never accepted Christ into my heart. If I were to die today, I don't know if I'd go to heaven, but I want to go to heaven. Then Jesus says, you must be born again. Unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Born again, what does that go? Do I go back into my mom's womb and come back out? He says, no. That which is flesh is flesh. That's what we are. But that which is spirit is spirit. Not, marvel not that I say, he must be born again. You have to receive Christ into your heart. The Bible says a lot of people believe him in their mind, but they don't have him in their heart. He says, with the heart, man confesseth unto righteousness with the mouth. Uh, uh, man believeth unto righteousness with the mouth. Confession is made unto salvation. The heart is the real you. You must trust him with your heart and your life. Be determined that you're not going to go backwards. You're going to go forward. You have to settle some things in your heart. Here's a question. Why do some people, that, why do they uh, go back to the world while they talk dirty, swear, and all that? It's because there's something in their heart that's not right. I was talking to somebody not too long ago about this issue. Actually, a couple of people. For me, it's not a battle. For some, it's a battle not to curse, not to do this, not to do that. It's not a battle for me. Because there was a time in my life where I made a determination. I want God in my heart. See, somewhere you've opened some chambers of your life. You've allowed the devil in there. And he has occupied for such a long time. He's had control of your life. And you go to church and you try, you get in the Word of God and you try to cast him out. And the devil, he's not going to go out quietly. He's going to go out kicking and screaming. And you've got to slam that door on him and say, you're not welcome here. But you need to replace it with something. I'm going to skip down to the last point here. Because I, this is the most important part of it. Here's the most important part. I've talked to some gentlemen about issues, problems they've had. And I already knew the answer to this. And I said, let me ask this. Do you have a devotional time each day that you have with the Lord? Is there a time in your day where you sit down with the Lord and you open your Bible and you just read for 10, 15, 20 minutes and then pray? And the answer was, no, I struggle in that area. That's why. You do not have a personal walk with the Lord. And my friends, that is key to having success in your Christian life. That's the key to cleaning the heart out. That's the key to getting rid of those things that keep trying to come back into your life. Because you open your heart to Jesus. Jesus comes in. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open the door, I'll come into him and sup with him and he with me. If you let him in, he's going to come and he's going to sweep. He's going to garnish. He's going to clean it up. He's going to make it nice. And as he's sweeping, you're having a continual day by day fellowship with the Lord. You're reading your Bible. Say, Lord, search me and try me. If there be any wicked way in me, show me so that I can be clean with you and right with you. And you let him in. You spend 15, 20 minutes every single morning with him, with your Bible, your quiet time. And what you're going to find out, three weeks five weeks, six weeks, a month, two months from now, some of that stuff's going to be gone. You're not going to be talking the way you talk. It's going to be behind you. And sometimes you won't even notice it. Why? Because something has exited when Jesus came in to fill it. And there's, you're going to go through different phases. One phase is Satan is going to try to stop you from doing that because he can't handle the Word of God. He's going to try, oh, you're too busy. The phone rings. You need to get over here. You need to get over here now. You know what you do? You make time for God. What I found out too, when I make time for God, He gives me that time back and then some. Some of the most successful days that I've had, and Christians, some of you know this too, for in your own life. You've experienced it. When you take time for God, by spending time in His Word and prayer, you find out that you get more done in that day than you've gotten done in a long time. Isn't that right? Have you had that? You've seen that? Because he gives it back to you. You honor me, I'll honor you, he says. And I always give back greater. 
he says. That's awesome. But here you are, you're cleaning your life out. You're letting God in on a daily basis. And some of those things are being swept out of your life, sometimes without even knowing it. You have to determine, I'm going to follow him. I'm going to have that quiet time with the Lord on a daily basis. The swearing's going to go. The drinking's going to go. The wicked thoughts are going to go. Because Jesus is there occupying every chamber of your life. Do you remember Solomon? He didn't follow God fully. We need to follow him fully. That's how you get success. That's how you have victory. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus Christ's name.